I've started it. Okay, we're ready to go. Um, I want to call the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz City Planning Commission uh, November 19th to order. Could we have a, call, a roll call, please? Commissioner Conway? Here. Selman? <clears throat> <laughs> You're still muted. <laughs> Sorry, I'm here. Thank you. Commissioner Greenberg. I can't hear you. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Dawson. Oh, here we go. Uh, here, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Nielsen, Maxwell, Commissioner Schifrin. Here. Okay. Uh, Commissioner uh, Maxwell and Nielsen are absent with notification. Are there any statements of disqualification? Hearing none, I'll move on. Are there any, is there anybody around who wants to give us oral communication? Uh, if there are any members of the public wish, who wish to address the commission at this time, please press star nine to raise your hand. This is for matters that are not on the agenda, but reasonably before the commission. I don't see anyone raising their hand, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on if this is a problem for anyone. Um, given the technological challenges, we can come back to that if somebody later decides that they had an oral communication. We'll move to the approval of the minutes. Is it correct that both minutes, of, uh, the recommendation is to continue them till the next meeting? I have uh, requested the continuance of the minute, the approval of the minutes of the 14th of October. Um, I provided you uh, uh, yesterday with the minutes of the 11-5 uh, hearing, and uh, it's your, the discretion of the board how you want to handle that. So is there a motion to continue the approval? Is it the 15th or the 14th of October? It's the 15th. I'm sorry. There were two back-to-back -back meetings, so the subject line of the email I sent, you said the 14th, but the memo that's um, posted to the record does reflect the accurate date. Would someone um, like to um, move that we continue the minutes of October 15th to our next meeting? I would move a continuance of the minutes to the next meeting. Is there a second? I'll second, second. that. Commissioner mm -hmm. Dawson seconds it. Um, I guess we need a roll call for everything, so let's have a roll call vote, please. Continuing the October 15th minute. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Stallman. Aye. Greenberg. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Chair Schifrin. Aye. Um, so any, does anyone have any comments on the minutes of November 5th? Seeing none, um, would somebody like to move approval of the November 5th, 2020 minutes? A motion to approve the minutes for November 5th, 2020. Is there a... I second. Uh, Commissioner Conway? Aye. Spellman? Aye. Greenberg? Aye. Dawson? Aye. Chair Schifrin? Aye. We'll now move to, uh, it passes unanimously, we'll now move to general business, item number three, the resilient Coast Santa Cruz West, who will be making the presentation. Welcome again, Tiffany. Hello, Commissioner.
commissioners, good evening. Uh, very nice to be with you this evening. Can you all see my screen? Okay, very good. Uh, I was last in front of you, uh, your commission about three months ago on the uh, Resilient Coast Santa Cruz Initiative, and we are nearing completion of these projects, and I am back for an update with some of our recommendations. So, move ahead here. Just again, want to remind you these two projects. Um, that Resilient Coast is comprised of is the West Cliff Drive Adaptation and Management Plan, which is focused on identifying not just the short-term projects um, that we will uh, get streamlined permitting for, but also to indicate our current thinking on adaptation pathways. So what might those medium and longer-term strategies look like uh, in the future, but not locking us into those, really just focusing on the short-term projects. And I'm going to share with those recommendations with you today. And then the second product coming out of the Resilient Coast Initiative is this uh, local coastal program amendment with sea level rise policies. Um, and that has been very focused on the beaches. However, we are incorporating policies to support uh, the near-term adaptation strategies we're identifying in the West Cliff Drive plan. So that will be integrated. And I just want to thank uh, Chair Schifrin, who also participates in the Technical Advisory Committee, along with a number of other folks. Um, and we've really had a number of stakeholder groups involved. Just this past Tuesday, we had our uh, virtual uh, community workshop. We had 146 people um, coming in and out, uh, you know, through that time, and I'll talk more about that later. Just to refresh your memory, this uh, the scope of this project, the geographic scope, is from Seabright Beach um, on over to Natural Bridges State Beach and all the bluffs, beaches, and backing development. To date, we've delivered a number of, um, of uh, documents and studies to support getting to the point of recommendations in addition to the community and stakeholder engagement. Um, you know, behind this delivered to date box, you can see, um, you know, and I think I may have showed you last time what uh, some of the existing conditions work and the future vulnerability assessments look like. Um, we've also developed these adaptation strategy and pathway evaluations. So really looking at what's the suite of options that are available to us and doing some um, synthesizing of those and narrowing based on community input and technical feasibility. The socially vulnerable populations impact uh, assessment is rather novel and uh, that was completed. I think many of you were able to try our VR uh, phase one and two and that's available also online um, if you'd like to check that out. And then we came to an adaptation strategy uh, technical report where we've started to narrow down onto recommendations that was supplemented by our cost benefit analysis for West Cliff Drive. And I'm going to share with you the initial findings from that, um, as well as um, some initial set of LCP recommendations from our consultants. Um, we also have some uh, concepts on funding, and one of our next step projects will be to explicitly develop a funding mechanism and funding plan uh, because there are a lot of projects recommended in the near term. I just want to also clarify that on the beaches, so Seabright, Maine, Powell, Natural Bridges, there is no commensurate vehicle to the West Cliff Drive vehicle in terms of getting streamlined permitting for near term projects. So while we're indicating what our pathways might look like in developing policies to support that, we are not developing projects as part of the LCP amendment. I just want to make that clear. As you all know, we've been doing extensive research. We've had, or I'm sorry, outreach. We've had over 1,500 touch points in the community through a variety of different ways. Um, I think we've talked about that in the past, so I won't um, I won't talk too much about that. Um, and I think you've seen this slide before also, how all the pieces connect together in terms of the engagement, um, starting with, you know, some initial set of eight focus groups that really focused on uses and values all the way through, you know, our open houses, 
over 70 talks I gave over the past two years. Um, you know, all those things sifting down to the actual policy and plan recommendations. And where you see those um, red brackets is where, where we're at right now. So you can see we're, we're very close to the end. And I do want to acknowledge the additional capacity that we've gained through our academic partnerships, which have been so valuable to lending us capacity to really spend time in the beach flats. And I, I think I've mentioned that before. Um, I just want to remind you about the adaptation pathways um, concept itself in that we are, you know, we're saying short term is 10 to 15 years. We're not defining what medium or long term looks like because we're really relying on these physical triggers to signal when we go to the next strategy. And these strategies can um, fall across these three categories of accommodate, protect, and retreat, or realign, or relocate. And a couple of those concepts are shown here. Um, this is just reminding you that we do have um, erosion, rising tides, and coastal storm flooding um, at our beaches. And the blue uh, shading that you can see over our streetscapes and so forth, that's what we are projecting out through the end of the century. The lighter the color is more towards the end of the century. I've, these maps are derived from our 2018 adaptation plan update. So we've, we've presented on this uh, maybe two or three years ago. So we have three pathway recommendations that we could pursue at Seabright Beach. And there is no consensus right now. We don't have a clear consensus between these three pathways that I'm going to show you in, in the community. And, and amongst our, uh, our technical advisory committee has a different recommendation than what a very limited pop set of our population um, preference was. And we haven't had state parks weigh in, this, weigh in on this today. We were supposed to today, actually, and it got rescheduled. So that's obviously going to play into this. Nonetheless, the near-term projects are the same, and that is expanding and enhancing the living shoreline concept. There is already restoration that happened there, which is a living shoreline through Groundswell Coastal Ecology and their partnership with Galt School. We're recommending enhancing that in the near, near term. Um, there also are potentially some stormwater upgrades. We are going to be recommending televising all of the stormwater outfalls across the coast and developing a replacement program for those are, that are deficient. The scope of this project really only looked at the outfall condition, and that's not really indicative of performance. And in terms of the trails, we are assessing right now, um, I'm going to be going out with Parks and Rec uh, next week, and we're going to be assessing uh, which informal trails we want to have some intervention on, and that's across the whole uh, the whole coastline that uh, that applies. So, in this concept, though, getting back to Seabright Beach after the living shorelines and some of these other near-term upgrades, the thought here was, okay, when we experience whatever the trigger is for this, I think it is the minimum beach width, we would raise the jetty and uh, do some kind of beach nourishment and then eventually manage retreat. And here at Seabright, that would be public property first. Now, pathway two, and pathway one, by the way, there were about 25 people um, who responded to that survey, so not a big sample and not representative of our community, but they did prefer that first pathway with managed retreat. Pathway two, which was the preference of our technical advisory committee, has the same near-term project and then it calls for new or upgraded armoring and then raising the jetty and beach nourishment. So little different sequencing and not having the managed retreat concept. And pathway three is incremental retreat. And this was not preferred by um, either the TAC or the, um, the few members of our community that responded on this. Again, the near-term stuff's the same, but then we start to retreat public property and then eventually private property. So again, this is likely going to fall out from consideration. We don't, we didn't have um, preference on that. Um, moving to Maine and Cow Beach, uh, we did have consensus around pathway two, um, which is protect, accommodate, and then retreat. 
And so again, there is a living shoreline concept here. In fact, we just applied to the Ocean Protection Council last Friday to do a feasibility study to couple a living shoreline where you can see 1A is here near to the river mouth um, with some improved access on the back side of the boardwalk and potentially some kind of um, something that might prevent the meandering of the river mouth. Then you can see getting into the medium term, the, this pathway also calls for extending the curb wall that runs across Towel and Main Beach between the beach and the road and then continues between the boardwalk and the road. So it isn't this black and white line that you see in front of the boardwalk, it's actually on Beach Street, that's where that would be. And then uh, we would do some accommodation to increase resiliency that could be like elevating things, and then finally to a retreat concept. Okay, at Natural Bridges State Beach, um, again, the living shoreline uh, concept is fairly consistent with uh, state parks, um, their guidance for long-term management. Of course, both on Seabright and on Natural Bridges, state parks makes the final call. They own and operate, but we've been working really closely with them. This is also an area where the managed retreat concept does really have legs. And you can see um, we are showing some retreat at the parking lot, um, and we have some improvements also scheduled for the entrance there. Okay, continuing on. So now into West Cliff Drive. The findings from our cost-benefit analysis, we did four different um, uh, scenarios. Business as usual, we looked at a recreation-focused set of strategies. Uh, a protection-focused set of strategies, which is armoring and riprap, and then a managed retreat strategy. And what we found is that the recreation-focused actions showed the highest benefit, really the highest net present value and probability of success. So that's maintaining the rec trail, surf, beach, and so forth. Business as usual, which, again, is doing the best we can with the resources we have to keep up with stuff, it will always cost us more in the long run. And then managed retreat and a protection-focused uh, action is better undertaken on the earlier side, what, before sea level rise gets to nine inches, which, you know, we don't know. There's a lot of uncertainty, but that's certainly more mid-century. So the key decision here is really whether and how to invest in the short term or pay more in the long term. Okay, the strategies that we are, or the projects rather, that we are recommending to implement in the near term include some transportation enhancements, which I'm going to show you. I think I may have showed you a uh, snippet of that last time. Um, a coastal armory maintenance program, so specifying the maintenance. Um, and a lot of, there are other revetment and armoring uh, plans in the West Cliff Drive plan in terms of replacement but maintenance, we need to do a, a program strategy along with the stormwater replacement. Um, you know, there is this notion of putting sand down at Pyramid Beach and uh, having the benefit of littoral drift and um, depositing on the down coast beaches. Um, that we were, we really need to do a feasibility study of that. We've only, you know, done very conceptual work on that. I already mentioned some of the access improvements. So vertical would be, you know, stairs and that kind of thing, and lateral would be maybe some of those informal trails. I mentioned the stormwater uh, televising and uh, replacement plan that we need to do. We have we're identifying areas for habitat and landscape improvements, and um, we really think there's a ton of opportunity to expand education and inclusiveness. And then I've already mentioned. Then really one of the nearest term things is to develop the financing mechanism and funding plan. And we have a lot of good guidance from our consultants on that. And by the way, I failed to mention that Ross Clark, our consultant um, for the LCP project, is on the line if you have questions at the end. In terms of armoring itself, um, we, what we'll be recommending is retrieving fugitive rocks as feasible that have become unstacked and restacking them. Um, and repairing and adding new rock to some existing revetment when it loses its slope or it loses its elevation. And then, of course, there are other things like cave fills to preempt emergency repairs. And I, I know the Zone 2 map is not easy to see, but it really just shows you all the different riprap and uh, revetment sites that we have 
If you look in the upper right-hand corner, that number 11 with the yellow circle, those, that's the fugitive rocks that we're talking about, and there's a number of locations where those rocks exist. This is the whole sand management concept that I mentioned. If you look at the red dot in the lower left-hand corner, that's Pyramid Beach. Um, our, uh, our ge I'm sorry, geomorphologist who's leading the Westbrook Drive project has calculated that, you know, if the dredge material from the harbor, potentially 10% of that could be used, or maybe there's other material. But finding suitable material is definitely part of this feasibility study as is impact to down coast beaches. Um, yeah, so that's that one. And uh, in terms of access, we do have fencing um, and railing that's going to be replaced in the near term. Some stair repairs, some stair repairs just happened um, as part of Westcliff Drive phase three improve, uh, I'm sorry, phase two improvements, phase three improvements are in design. We're looking at where are there overlooks, potential new overlooks or trail pull-off spots that we can develop by removing ice plant? And where can we do some restoration work? Uh, Parks and Rec is eager to pilot some, you know, small-scale restoration work. Um, we are going to be improving transportation and cliff safety signage. We're recommending that, I should say. And we are rem rem I'm sorry, recommending the design and installation of a single-stall bathroom at Bethany Curb. Um, on the lands on the habitats and landscape, I think I've already mentioned that we are identifying areas where that's appropriate, and our consultants have provided for us um, for marine and terrestrial uh, habitat where where there might be suitable um, opportunities. And then on transportation, this is a really important um, piece here is that the only short-term projects, that we are recommending in this West Class Drive plan relate to signage and striping improvements. And so that includes sharrows and so forth. And you can see right here uh, the intersection with Santa Cruz Street that's kind of uh, a, a good example of the, what we're um, recommending across the corridor. There we have heard, um, you know, some, some misinformation in the community that, um, that we are recommending going to one way or detouring West Cliff Drive, and that is not the case. We are re we were required to look at one way and um, under what conditions would we not have uh, cars on West Cliff Drive, and uh, you know, you, so that will be part of. Um, but there's no there's no plan to do that. We have concepts that we can consider. So. We will be including in the West Cliff Drive our current thinking, but we know that, you know, we need to look at in the medium term, what are the conditions actually like? What's community sentiment around this? Because it's really mixed. There, um, I think the, that there is just a split opinion on this. So this was something, this is probably the loudest thing that we've heard in our engagement recently, so I want to be really clear on that. And then the, our timeline to completion. We are going to have um, our West Cliff Drive uh, draft is going to be available on Monday for our task to review um, and our staff, of course, and, and key stakeholders. Um, and the plan itself will be done at, near the end of December. Um, the draft LCP amendment will be available at the end of December. And then we will finalize those in January and begin moving through the commission and uh, the city council hearing process. After that, about March, we'll be going to Coastal Commission. And that was our community meeting we had on Tuesday. And um, I'm sorry that I have that here because that is no longer an opportunity. But we've, I presented this on, uh, I think, Monday to TPW Commission. So I wanted to make sure they knew. And I think that's all I have for you then. Um, that's uh, the update. And I'm really happy to take any questions that you might have or comments. Um, this is a really great time for that. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Wise-West. Are there any questions that commissioners have? Um, if you could close down the uh, shared screen so we can see everybody, it would be helpful. Thank you. There you go. Uh, Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, hi, Tiffany. Thanks for, hi. for the presentation. 
I was one of those in and out of your Tuesday meeting. I couldn't stay for all of it, but uh, there was good uh, interaction, and I think uh, the public really had a good time listening to that. Good. I have one question. I didn't really get a sense for this concept of managed retreat and what that really means. I think mm -hmm. you talked about doing public spaces first and then private. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate mm -hmm. just a little bit on, on what that entails? Sure. So we don't have it clear, clearly defined because for us, retreat is really more a medium to longer term um, uh, option. However, because we don't have, we have only one home that's on the ocean side um, of West Cliff Drive and Seabright, public property is what will be retreated first because we don't have homes that are on the ocean side. What exactly that looks like, that's going to be an evolving, this is just the start of the managed retreat conversation, and that's going to be an evolving conversation. You know, all of these next step studies and so forth, there will be a lot of engagement. We are going to be continuing a lot of engagement on this because it's really clear that we don't have consensus in our community around some of these topics, retreat being one of them. Um, so that, I mean, I'm sorry, I don't have more detail. That That is what we're thinking right now. Okay. I guess I was, I was looking for, so in the public realm, what would be an example of, of managed retreat? Sure. Okay. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for allowing me to clarify. So, um, for example, on West Cliff Drive, that's where that whole one-way concept comes in, right? Like, we could eventually, although, as you saw, we really are recommending buffering our armoring in the near term, and that's kind of, you know, might be the last time we get to do something like that. But then after that, when we when we do nail down, you know, that it, if and when we nail down that retreat is the concept, as we allow the, the uh, coastline to move in on West Cliff Drive, the first thing it's going to hit is the rec, ta rec trail, right? So that's something that's within our purview. And then next would be the first lane of, um, or the, the oceanward lane of West Cliff Drive. So that's public infrastructure. Um, so that's kind of what I'm talking about. Same thing in Seabright. Okay. Um, we have public infrastructure before we get to private. Right. Th thanks for elaborating on that. That makes it Definitely. more clear what's going on. Definitely. Um, Thank you. That was really my only question. I mean, I think this is obviously, you know, shedding light on such a tremendous resource that we have and setting up the framework for planning to, you know, ensure that this uh, is available to everyone moving forward. So, yeah, I, I look forward to the final report and, you know, rallying the community, so to speak, to really understand how profound this work uh, is going to be. Thank you for your comments. Other commissioners, Commissioner Dawson, questions? Comments. Yeah, thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, I, I just was wondering if you could um, talk a little bit more about the role and the interaction we're having with state parks. Um, I think a former colleague of mine is leading up their work, Marina Cozorla. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, we were together at the Ocean Protection Council, and I'm just kind of wondering what that looks like and, and how yep. parks is thinking about that, um, you know, and how that interaction between the municipality and parks is, is proceeding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question, Commissioner. So state parks has been one of our key stakeholders. Um, at every major deliverable, they've had an opportunity to review and pro provide comments, and we meet with them between every major deliverable to make sure that we are tracking. Um, as I said, today was our day, like one of our final ones we were going to have, and it got postponed um, for a couple weeks. But in addition to that, we're working with state parks on next step projects, because obviously Natural Bridges and Seabright and Lighthouse Field, actually, anything with Lighthouse Point and Field, I, I failed to mention that, we have to be hand in hand on that, right? It's, it's, it's their, their place, their space to manage and own but we have done all of the engagement around, you know, what these strategies should look like. So they're, they're really cooperating with us. But the next step project we already have, you know, one of the things that's coming out of this is the triggers monitoring program, right? And what we're trying to do is piece together 
um, observational data uh, uh, sources that already exist and what's new. And state parks is key on that. We applied to a National Science Foundation grant with Ann Kapuczynski from UCSC to get funding to develop that with Scripps, with state parks. State parks is already talking to Scripps about putting another buoy in. So we're really deep into those conversations. Um, and it's been a really great working relationship um, with them so far, both with their local Santa Cruz district and with their state sea level rise and adaptation group. So we really benefited. And we have the same relationship with Coastal Commission, local staff and the um, sea level rise, the state sea level rise people. They also, and this is unusual, I think, or, or maybe the first time we've done this, Coastal has been doing the same thing reviewing everything, meeting in between to make sure we're aligned so that there's no surprises at the end, hopefully. Great. Thank you so much. It's uh, really good to hear all that interaction with the regulatory agencies as we're moving forward and the landowner state park. So good to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Other commissioners with questions, comments? Well, I want to thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm looking forward to actually getting something that the commission can act on, um, the LCP amendments, and I guess the plan itself, which yep. is, is really going to be a critical document because that's going to be the basis of um, grants and permits from the Coastal Commission. Uh, there was a question I had about the difference between an LCP amendment and a public works plan. Um, mm -hmm. Just to talk about uh, there being a public works plan yes. um, for the um, for carrying out the, the the resilience plan. So, could you describe the difference between those? How they interrelate? Yes. yes. Thank you for that question. So that is a big difference in these projects, even though the scopes are relatively similar. So the goal of the West Cliff Drive plan was to um, resolve emergency repair permits and to get streamlined permitting for near-term projects and across the whole gamut of what I presented. The vehicle to do that is a public works plan. So there's a specific format and uh, content that needs to be uh, included in that, including things like best management practices, a number of the different maps that I was going to show you, some design standards. So it's really specific. It doesn't get to it doesn't get to design, but it gives a lot of specificity towards what we want to do in the near term. Then with the LCP amendment, the LCP is not a project by project implementation vehicle. It is a policy vehicle, and so the LCP will include policies that enable us to do those short term projects. However, there will need to be it doesn't need to be a massive West Cliff Drive vehicle necessarily, but there needs to be some other kind of planning vehicle to make sure that these near-term projects on the beaches actually happen. And again, we did not go into the same depth of analysis um, on the beaches as we did with West Cliff Drive. It's just the scopes were a little different. So there will need to be a future vehicle. And I also want to call on Catherine um, Donovan is on the line, and she's. I just want to make sure that if is there anything else that I, I should mention with respect to that, because the planners are the pros on the on the LCP, and I, and I am not a planner, so I want to make sure I I spoke properly there. Yeah, I think. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, that's exactly right. Um, the LCP will be the sort of the high level policy document. On West Cliff Drive, we'll have the public works plan, which is sort of is. Think, think of it as a programmatic document that will cover, hopefully it will cover all the projects within the next 10 to 15 years so that we won't have to go through this individual project by project review with um, the Coastal Commission. And then our plan is to incorporate the work that we've done on the beaches into the um, LCP probably as an appendix or an attachment to the document so that we keep that information um, adopted and, and as part of our, our work, but it won't be, um, you know, the, the LCP is not a 
project level. So um, we just want to, we're just going to sort of, it's going to be a holding place for that information. So if I understand you, with a public works plan, the individual projects uh, consistent with that plan do not need coastal permits. With an LCP <laughs> amendment, um, their need, that's on a more of a policy level, and the, pl and the projects that carry out the LCP um, uh, amendment policies would need, would need coastal permits. Am I understanding that correctly? That's mm -hmm. semi-correct. The, semi yeah. the public works plan projects um, will need permits. They are, they cannot, it, once the public works plan has been approved, the Coastal Commission cannot deny the permits that are, that are in that plan, but they can condition them. And this is a, a process through the Coastal Commission, and so we have asked lots of questions, and it's clear to us that this is um, something that is sort of amorphous. It's, it, it happens differently in different areas with different types of plans. So it depends on the level of specificity that we have in our public works plan. So for the projects that we really know what we're going to do, the permit may even, we may even be able to get it approved at a, at a local level. But um, for some of these that we're just sort of describing more conceptually, they probably will still need to go through the Coastal Commission, but they are, they cannot deny them. And that's a big one, as, as you know. Well, it is, and that's it is why many coastal uh, permits that were approved and conditioned in such a way that they, the project could never possibly happen. So, um, but that's helpful. But let me follow with another question about CEQA. Um, it's the, I assume the Public Works Plan, like the LCP amendment, will have to go through the CEQA process. Uh, will the individual projects uh, carrying out those two documents have to go through the CEQA process as well, or does, I would assume with the LCP they would, uh, but does having a, a public works plan um, exempt projects from, the, from CEQA review? Um, going through the Coastal Commission is the equivalent of a CEQA review. So we, the city does not need to prepare the CEQA documentation for this, although we have to provide, the, the Coastal Commission staff is asking us to provide them with all the information they need to do the CEQA analysis. So saying we don't have to do the CEQA is a little bit, um, we don't literally have to do it, but we have to do all the analysis and provide them with that information. So we might as well be doing it. Um, and uh, it, again, it, it will, it, you know, it, the ones that actually, end, the projects that actually end up having to get Coastal Commission approval um, will probably need further analysis. The ones that um, are described thoroughly enough in the Public Works Plan that they won't need to go to the commission itself, those probably won't need any further analysis. So it's sort of like a, a, a program level EIR if you have um, specific projects that are described in the program. It's kind of like what's happening with the Wolf Master Plan where the overall plan is programmatic, but there are a couple of projects that are were analyzed at a project level and they don't exactly. need any yeah, that's right. exactly right. Now, will the public works plan itself need a CEQA document, either an EIR or an, uh, a negative declaration? They don't need a CEQA document because the review by the Coastal Commission is the equivalent of a CEQA review. So it doesn't literally have a CEQA document, but they do the same type of review. Well, as I understand it, certain state agencies can have what are called certified regulatory programs. And that's sort of the equivalent of the normal CEQA process, although it allows for some exceptions. But in terms of uh, identification of potential impacts, mitigation, consideration of alternatives, allowing for public input, 
the certified regulatory programs need to provide all of that. So my experience with the Coastal Commission is they don't really have the staff capacity to do that kind of analysis, um, and they don't have the money to hire it. So if the city wants approval, as you're, sort of, as you're kind of indicating, the city really has to provide the CEQA document, even though it's not the normal EIR NAG deck. That's exactly right. And, and we won't be providing them in the form of a, you know, we won't be going through the CEQA checklist and doing the initial study and, and you know, going through that process. But we will be, the, the conversations that we've had so far, it sounds as if we will be providing them with the analysis and then they will be incorporating it into their written document that they will be taking to their, to the, to the Coastal Commission itself. So we'll be working with the staff on that. And Tiffany yeah, is they, nodding her head. Yeah, they, might, they've indicated. Might be worth the reading analysis. their certified regulatory program to see exactly what they need. Because in the past, uh, I know with their, some project with the county, they pretty much said the county had to do um, the CEQA document, even though they just then would use it um, as part of their process. So, it, you know, they really want to minimize the amount of uh, substantive work that they have to do. Yeah, they've really indicated, though, that the level of analyses that we have done are likely going to suffice for the technical analyses that would typically be needed for a CEQA document. So, you know, we don't have assurance of that, but that's what the conversation has been so far. And, you know, they've been guiding these documents in terms of what we need, you know, and to what level do, of detail do we need. Okay, well, I, I know personally I'm looking forward to the process moving forward. Um, the, the Us need too. Great, um, and it's, uh, it's been a long road, and I want to thank you for all your work on this. Um, unfortunately, it still has a long road to go, I'm afraid, and uh, we can take it a at a time. Are there any other comments or questions by commissioners? Well, let me thank you for your presentation. I think we're um, done with this item. Okay, There's thank no you. We're being expected. Thank you so much. So thank you very much. And we will move on to item number four, which is 119 Call Street number CP20-0047. And I won't read the whole paragraph unless I have to. But I will ask for a staff report. Good evening. I just want to confirm that. Can you guys all hear me? Yes. Yes. This is Ryan Bain, Senior Planner. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So just let me know if you can see this. Be able to yes. see that? Okay, great. So, um, yes, we're here tonight to consider a project at 119 Coral Street. for me? There we go. Um, so the 0.77 square foot, or acre I should say, uh, site is located near the northwest corner of Highway 1 and, and River Street, that intersection there. And it's part of the Homeless Services Center or campus that is surrounded mainly by commercial and industrial uses there. So the project that's being proposed is a five-story uh, mixed-use project to provide services and supportive housing for the chronically homeless. Um, the first floor um, will consist of a new recuperative care center, a behavioral health clinic, and uses related to the upper floor residences. And the upper four stories will consist of 120 uh, supportive single-room occupancy units and one manager's unit. So the parcel is um, accessed from Coral Street. This is the main entrance to the campus. Um, the project site, which is, there's actually two parcels. This is the uh, parcel that we're mainly looking at here. This is another parcel that's separate. Um, but the current parcel and the site con consists of a recuperative care center and six transitional um, housing 
units located within um, single story uh, buildings. I think they're, they're portables as well as some uh, at grade parking. So there's one heritage tree located on the project site that's going to be saved and there are uh, 20 trees along Highway 1 and along the railroad perimeter that were also evaluated as far as this project since they're near uh, the proposed uh, building, um, but none of those trees are proposed for removal. So the subject site is, uh, has a, a community commercial um, general plan designation. Uh, this designation applies to areas that accommodate businesses that serve the general needs of the community, um, including mixed-use projects such as this, um, and also that um, have commercial uses on the ground floor such as, as this project. Um, the general plan also calls for a uh, floor area ratio from, point for, from 0.25 to 1.75, and this project uh, proposed FAR is right in there at 1.68. There are numerous general plan policies that are included in the staff report. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are quite a few, um, especially out of our housing element, that um, this project meets, um, providing shelters and services for those in need. Um, we're, we're doing concessions and financial incentives and assistance and density bonuses um, to facilitate affordable housing. Um, there's collaboration with nonprofits uh, to develop affordable housing. So there's numerous housing element um, policies that this project is meeting. The zoning for the project is CC or Community Commercial, and the purpose that's indicated in the zoning code um, for Community Commercial is to provide locations throughout the community for a variety of commercial and services use, uses for residents of the city and the region which from both the policies of the general plan, which we just determined it does, uh, and to encourage a harmonious mixture of a wide variety of commercial and residential activities, including limited industrial uses, that they are compatible and nuisance-free. So what permits are being considered tonight by the Planning Commission? We have four of them. Uh, one is a residential demolition authorization permit, a design permit, a special use permit, and the density bonus. So the residential demolition authorization permit, um, since there is currently um, house, so six transitional housing units I mentioned, as well as a recuperative care center, um, those are pro proposed to be removed or demolished. And pursuant to our residential demolition conversion authorization permit ordinance, there are certain findings that need to be made uh, to permit the demolition of those structures, uh, such as it's not listed as a historic structure, which these aren't in this particular case and that the project is approved to, um, there's a project that's approved to replace um, these structures, and obviously there's 121 units being proposed to replace those units, so it's meeting all those requirements. Um, also, a design permit is required. So the proposed mixed-use uh, project consists of uh, a five-story building um, with a footprint that covers approximately a third of the site area. As you can see, it's a, a rectangular shaped building. It's about 50 by 208 feet in length, uh, generally paralleling. This is Highway 1. Um, there's an existing trash enclosure and proposed uh, pad-mounted PG&E transformer here to the east that's um, being proposed. And then there's a bike storage building um, located to the rear of the building adjacent to, to Highway 1. And then you can see these are, these are parking spaces um, and the main entrances to the building are along this, uh, this frontage. So the first floor plan um, will have two main entrances. Uh, this entrance is along the, uh, they're both along the north elevation. Uh, this is for the residences. Um, there's a community room, um, reception, laundry, um, uh, mail, all those type of things, some offices um, on that first floor. And then there's also an entrance to the recuperative care um, clinic as well as the behavioral health clinic that's located um, um, more toward the east side of the uh, first floor. The second through fourth floor are all, um, are all units. And then on the fifth floor, we have units uh, in addition to uh, indoor lounge as well as an outdoor common space for, for all the residents. Here's kind of what a typical 
um, unit look like. Um, there's, they range from 256 to 267 square feet in size. Uh, all have bathrooms and kitchenettes. So it gives you an idea of, of what the unit looks like. Um, the maximum height of buildings in the CC zoning district is three stories and 40 feet. However, um, as I mentioned, there's a density bonus being requested as part of this, and density bonus law, um, specifically AB 1763, uh, provides, provides tools to incentivize affordable housing by allowing um, concessions from development standards uh, including a density bonus of 80% for 100% affordable housing developments and additional height in the way of uh, three additional stories and 33 feet above the maximum height um, for this particular zone district. So um, in addition to the, the concession I just mentioned, there's also they're requesting concessions to bike parking and storage. So with the exception of those three concessions, all the other CC zone district requirements are being, are being met. Here's just a look at the west, this is the west, and this is the east elevation. You can kind of see the outdoor um, area up there. Um, here's kind of the, and this is the north uh, elevation showing the main entrances. Um, it's a contemporary design, um, kind of incorporates a variety of exterior finish materials, including uh, board form concrete for that first floor, uh, panelized metal cladding, um, perforated metal screen, sunshade, uh, steel trellises, and metal windows. Uh, a view from the south elevation on the south side, uh, kind of facing Highway 1. This is kind of an outdoor area. Here's the uh, uh, bicycle parking. Here is a view from Highway 1. Here's a section drawing just to give you an idea. First floor and then the four, four floors of units above. Um, in regards to parking, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, with the proposed project consisting of supportive housing, rental units, AB 1763 uh, prohibits the city from requiring parking uh, for the residential portions of the development. So. Uh, however, parking can be uh, required for the non-residential, so we have the, the clinics on the first floor, uh, and based on the 4,372 square feet of clinics on the first floor, um, our ordinance will require 22 parking spaces, um, and they're providing 30, so they're more than meeting the, the parking requirement. Uh, also, a special use permit is required. Um, so pursuant to our CC zoning, mixed residential and commercial office developments with 10 or more multiple dwelling or condominiums uh, above commercial uses or units on the same lot, as well as single room occupancy, um, 16 units or more, um, all require a special use, use permit um, be approved in order to be developed within the CC zoning. Um, so as I mentioned, the first floor has kind of three distinct uses. There's a residential area um, that includes a congregating space, laundry mail. Um, there's, it's staffed 24-7, um, and there are staff offices and meeting rooms as well. Um, also, there's a uh, recuperative care center that currently operates on the site. This is currently and is expected to continue to be a 12-bed facility providing care for those who have been homeless and enter from Dominican Hospital or other medical facilities. And then a behavioral health clinic which is anticipated to be operated by the county, providing services to those experiencing homelessness. And then, of course, as I mentioned, the, the uh, 120 supportive uh, SR units and the manager's unit um, for the stories above. As I mentioned, the density bonus, um, the California State Density Bonus Law, um, specifically AB 1763, um, provides tools to incentivize affordable housing by allowing concessions from development standards, uh, including a density bonus of 80% for 100% affordable housing developments. So for this subject project, 100% um, affordable supportive housing development, the applicants are proposing an 80% density bonus above the base case, uh, including concessions to district height standards, bike parking, and storage. Here's, here it kind of gives you a little bit of a view. So under the CC zone district, which is up above here, 
um, the maximum building height is three stories and 40 feet. So these standards would limit the residential portion of the project to just two levels or about 27,000 square feet. So working from this base case square footage, AB 1763 allows for an 80% increase to that base, so an additional 21,808 square feet or a total of 49,000. So in order to accommodate this additional square footage, uh, AB 1763 calls for cities to allow certain concessions, as I mentioned, and that's what allows for that additional height um, and massing. So the concession brings the overall height of the building to 58 feet, 6 inches. And as I had mentioned, there's also con uh, concessions being requested for bike parking and storage. Um, normally, bike parking with 121 class 1 would be required. They're providing 64. Uh, normally, 30 class 2 would be required. They're providing 20. And then there's no storage being provided. They're um, consistent with our city's community outreach policy. Uh, for planning projects, applicants held two uh, online webinars for the community to learn about the project, ask questions, and give input. Um, they had one, it was on April 2nd, they had one in the morning and then also in the evening. Um, city staff, as well as the project development team, um, made presentations. There were approximately 35 attendees. Um, all, um, overall, all attendees supported the project. Um, in addition, we, we had um, project web page that was created and posted on our city website. Um, we actually had links to the recorded webinars, um, which allowed for other members to, to review them and then also to submit comments. The California Environmental Quality Act uh, provides categorical exemptions, which are applicable to category, uh, categories of projects and activities that the lead agency has determined generally do not pose a risk of significant impacts on the environment. Um, in this particular case, the proposal qualifies for uh, Class 32 exemption for infill development, um, and the project meets all of the criteria for the infill, um, including being consistent with general plan designation and policies, um, consistent with the zoning designation and regulations. It's less than five acres in size. It does not, it does not have any uh, endangered or threatened species and habitat, and it will not result in any significant effects uh, related to traffic, noise, or air quality, or air quality, or water quality, I should say. Um, I was going to mention that we kind of late in the game, we did a, a revision to a couple of the uh, conditions of approval, 25 and 26, in relationship to some of the housing requirements. So I just wanted to uh, mention that, and I hope that you all received that email. Um, and this is also condition 26. They really didn't change much of the condition. It was more of a clarification. I know there was a couple of commissioners that had some questions, and we wanted to make sure that they were as clear <coughs> as possible. So we made some revisions to those and then sent those out to you. So um, the development uh, will implement the city's policy to work with operating agencies to provide shelters and services for those in need by providing a, a low-income supportive housing for individual adults who have experienced chronic homelessness and are typically high util utilizers of the healthcare system. And with a request for a density bonus, the project will maximize density while providing 121 uh, low-income units, which will be a significant addition um, to our city's affordable housing stock. So as condition, the project meets the requirements of the zoning ordinance and provides <laughs> development that is compatible with the surrounding area and in terms of its use, scale, and design. So uh, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission acknowledge the environmental determination and approve the residential authorization permit, design permit, special use permit, and density bonus request um, based on the findings and conditions that were uh, provided in the staff report. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Maybe we can get the whole screen back. Oh, yep. Thank you. Do commissioners have what the process we're going to follow is we'll have questions from commissioners. We'll um, ask for public comments, starting with the applicant, the applicant's representative, if uh, he or she is here. Uh, and then after the public testimony, we'll come back uh, to the commission for 
discussion and action. So are there uh, questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, I just had a quick clarifying uh, question uh, the, about the design related to the trees. Uh, it was stated in the staff report that all the tree, there were no trees were going to be removed. And then I was just looking at the arborist report, and there were several trees um, marked for potential removal. So I just was wondering if staff could clarify that. Uh, and one additional thing with that is the arborist recommended that a, a simple realignment of a, a, a drainage um, associated with the project could maintain a couple trees. And I was just wondering, um, I didn't see that in the conditions. So I just wanted a little bit of clarity around that. Thank you. Sure, yeah. Um, the, that we received the, when they originally uh, submitted the application, um, we had the arborist report and our city arborist reviewed it. And she agreed with the arborist um, and determine that, you know, that they, the recommendation that the um, drainage system be realigned or um, revised in order to save that tree um, in that corner. And so um, the applicant actually did that redesign. So the, their um, civil engineers redesigned that stormwater, and so that's already included on the plans. So um, I did... Since it was already revised and part of the approved plans, I didn't feel a need to, to add a condition of approval. That's great. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Spellman, you had a question? Yeah, I want to just follow up on uh, Commissioner Dawson's question. So the issue on, on removing trees or not, right, it, it sort of is in conflict. The, the Arbor's report does say trees are being removed, and staff report in your presentation say there are no trees being removed. That's one Correct. Question. There, yeah, there are there are no heritage trees being removed uh, as part of the project. Uh, like I mentioned, they, they revised the stormwater uh, or the drainage to make sure that it didn't impact the, uh, the trees on site. Okay. So you're clarifying heritage trees, though. So some trees are going, some, some smaller, insignificant trees potentially are being removed. I don't think there are any for, small for trees being project. removed either, actually. There's a, there's, I think there's a row of smaller trees that are not qualified as heritage trees along the north property line um, across the parking area, um, but they're not really near the proposed structure, so I don't think they're being proposed for removal. Okay. Yeah. Then I had two other quick questions. One, um, I'm back onto my presentation shtick again. This is, you know, it's not an insignificant project, and there is not a contextual site section through this project so that we can understand what the conditions are. It would have been um, really important to see that connection between Highway 1, the site, the properties behind, the right-of-way for the train, and the adjacent industrial uses. Those are, you know conflicting uses potentially, and it was even brought up by one of the members of the public in, in public comment. Uh, it would have been really good to see those conditions clearly represented, uh, even in a conceptual way. I don't know if these guys flew under the radar and got in before we finalized our um, recent, um, what do we call it, our, our checklist, so to speak, but um, it would have been nice to see that. Um, what else did I have? And then I had a, one, one question on density. So it seems like this project is a SRO, very small unit project, and it's only achieving the upper end of the general plan density range by virtue of, you know, an 80% density bonus. I'm just curious. I'm just, maybe that's just an observation. It seems, you know, we've been looking in the past few years at being critical of projects coming in, you know, at lower densities. And the argument has sort of been we don't want larger units on properties that can handle, you know, more units, essentially. We want you to develop to a density that, that meets the higher end of the, the general plan goals. Did that come up at all in, in your analysis? And is that 
just an anomaly for this site, essentially. I guess I'm it's, trying it's to understand that, your, your question exactly. You're saying, is this not maximizing, or why? Is well, it is at, at once you add the 80% density bonus, right? If that's not in there, they're not close to the higher end of the density range. Right? At 120 units, they're at you know pretty close to the to the highest uh, number in, in the general plan. But without that, they wouldn't you know wouldn't be close to it. Right. Um which is what we wanted. We want them to maximize, which I think they're doing. So is that... Yeah, maybe I'm not being clear. I mean, my point I... is the, the project only achieves it via the density bonus, which we want. Um, maybe it, it's a reflection on... It's a policy that doesn't reflect on all parcels the same, potentially. Anyway, we can pass on that. Don't worry about it. Well, let me... I'll uh, save you... Saying that the question, are you saying that the base density, which the density bonus is based, is not at the high end of the density range? And if it was at the high end of the density range and there was a density bonus of 80 percent, there'd be even more than 120 units. Is that am I under, is that really your question? Not exactly. I mean, so. At, at 70 units, right, if they, if they didn't choose to be a 100% affordable project, this is more of a, an exercise on um, the type of density we're looking for. Uh, this, this project obviously meets it and it has the size units that we're looking for. Um, yeah, maybe I'm not being clear. What would be the density under, uh, the maximum density under community commercial uh, without a density bonus? Oh, no, I, I have that keep... number. Go ahead. Did you say you have that number? I don't. No. I don't. Off the off the top of my head, I could I could I could find out for you. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? Uh, Commissioner Conway. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Ryan, thank you for this report. I really appreciate it. And this is really more of a comment. And I want to speak to the Page Smith Community House which is the existing use of the site. Um, it is one of the oldest uh, properties that was dedicated to um, serve people who are homeless um, starting in the 90s. And you're right, it did start out as modular units. Um, but it has long been and still is um, transitional housing for 40 uh, formerly homeless individuals. Um, it's true that the configuration includes some shared facilities, um, so we may call it um, six units. But I think repeatedly saying that we're, we're removing six units um, and we're getting 120, I think that that isn't really proportional to how that um, site has been um, serving the community for all these years. Those are 40 beds. Um, they've received repeatedly state and federal funding over a period of decades. Um, so I think it would be more accurate to describe them as 40 transitional housing beds. Um, the other thing is those the old portables were replaced in around 2008 with uh, new manufactured structures, factory built structures that were, um, you know, the site was reorganized a bit um, in order to accommodate the recuperative care center. Um, but the structures aren't that old. Um, they were at least touted as being, uh, you know, well built and built to last. I'm wondering if uh, there's, if you've considered any possibility of reusing those units. I'm not usually the one who's a big fan of reusing manufactured units, but in this case, they're um, designed for this purpose. Um, they're they're not very old. Um, of course, like any any uh, project providing housing uh, for anybody it requires land somewhere and and land that where it can be used that way um, but I would be really strongly in favor of an effort to reuse those structures yeah I, I, I think um, we're going to hear from the applicant Sibley Simon so um, yeah it'd, it'd be interested to hear 
exactly, you know, mm -hmm. what is currently there, um, the 40 beds, um, and then he may have some insight as to what the proposal is to do with those structure or with the uh, portables or the, the building. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Other commissioners have questions? Are you done, Commissioner Conway? Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Greenberg? Left on mute. Go ahead. Somehow you're still muted. Sorry about that. Um, just that I'm strongly in support of this uh, proposed project. It's very exciting that this is happening. Uh, it's incredibly needed for the community. Um, I am interested in the suggestion and the proposal that um, Commissioner Conway is making about reusing the existing units as well, and I'd love to hear a response to that that uh, proposal. But um, thank you for bringing this to the commission. I have a couple of questions. I really appreciate uh, staff's response to questions I sent in earlier. Um, one of the concerns I had, and it relates uh, to what Commissioner Conway raised, had to do with the, uh, the city's ordinance on replacement housing. And the reason why I'm uh, I'm raising this is that the density bonus law only requires that the affordable units be affordable for 55 years. The inclusionary um, ordinance requires that the units be affordable in perpetuity. Um, as I understand it, the replacement uh, ordinance also requires that they be um, that the replacement units be affordable in perpetuity. So the revised com, uh, conditions, as I understand them, and I might not be understanding them correctly, only uh, deal with the density, making clear, clarifying that the density bonus units are affordable for 55 years, uh, are 100 percent of the project is affordable for 55 years. 15 percent would be for 20, I don't know whether it's 15 or 20 would be affordable for um, but I wanted to ask staff about the status of the, um, how the replacement housing requirements would play in. I had assumed that there were only six units, but if there are 40 beds, I'm not sure whether the replacement housing requirements would be for 40 um, beds or for just the six units. But I think that to the extent that the replacement housing does require that the units be affordable in perpetuity, that that, that that be reflected in the conditions. So could you get a clarification? Um, I see uh, um, Ms. DeWitt is looking like she's ready to say something as I muted herself, so please go ahead. Good evening, um, chairs and, and council commissioners. Uh, so what I would like to talk about here is so there's a definition of what's called a dwelling unit and the replacement housing under the density law, it has to be considered a dwelling unit. And so what we really need from the applicant is to confirm that these are not dwelling units. And my understanding of the code, and I'm sure Ryan can step in and help out too, but my understanding of the city's code for the definition of a dwelling unit is that it has some kind of a kitchen or kitchenette with uh, at least two appliances and is a, of kind of a certain size. Um, so I, my understanding is these don't have kitchenettes, but I, again, I have not been inside and I don't know if anyone, if Ryan can help speak to that, but I think we definitely need a, a clarification from the applicant on whether these are actually considered dwelling units. Oh, but yeah, I haven't been inside either, so I think a clarification would be great. If they were dwelling units, then they would have the in perpetuity requirements. They would have okay. to follow the replacement requirements based on state density bonus law. Not even just the not even just the city inclusionary. They would have to follow state density bonus law for replacement as well. Right. Um, could I then? Um, I, I guess it wasn't clear to me whether the 120 units in this project. And maybe this is a question for the applicant. 
would also be transitional housing units, or are they going to be considered permanent housing units? That report is saying permanent supportive housing, but I, again, the, the applicant should clarify. Okay, um, those are my questions for now. Um, if there are no more com questions from commissioners, we'll open the public hearing and we'll first hear from the applicant or the representative of the applicant. Is that going to be Mr. Simon? I'm here. I think I've been unmuted. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay, you are. We, I could hear you. So go ahead. Great. Okay. Um, so I made some notes on some of those questions that came up, and uh, I'll try to step through them. Um, <clears throat> so the current use, uh, as Commissioner Conway said, is uh, Page Smith Transitional House as well as the Recuperative Care Center. The Recuperative Care Center is currently 12 beds. You, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so the recuperative care center is 12 beds and, the, and in the proposed building it's gonna be 12 beds at least. Um, but the current plan is 12 beds there. So then the, the other uh, buildings there on site are, tw are um, six different units. They are units in the sense they do have kitchen, bathroom, you know, they would, they, from a building point of view, they would qualify each one as one housing unit. Um, but they have a variable number of bedrooms in them, and they're operated not as permanent housing currently. They're operated as, operated as transitional housing, and there are 40 bedrooms and 40 beds there. So it is 40 individuals in a transitional housing program. That... Um, uh, funding for the operation of that uh, is going away. So, you know, it's a, uh, it has been, as was described, you know, funded for decades, both the creation of it and, um, and the operations in part uh, through federal funding, state funding, et cetera. And uh, federally, uh, the HUD funding for it has dwindled and now is, is scheduled to go away because uh, the federal government has been reapportioning its limited pool of funding for homelessness toward permanent supportive housing and homelessness pre prevention in broad strokes and less on transitional housing and less on funding emergency shelters, which has fallen to um, state and local government. And so um, is, it's one of the reasons we cited this project after years of puzzling about how to build this project, cited it there is in part because op that's the program where there's just not a, a, a continuing model for operational funding for the transitional housing. Now, yes, those are useful buildings, we hope. We are uh, engaged uh, in uh, multiple discussions on where can those go. Uh, we want them to be used, um, but first and foremost, there's some city and county staff um, that are uh, interested in trying to figure out <clears throat> where those can be used for emergency shelter or transitional housing needs within uh, Santa Cruz County. So we don't have an answer yet, but you know, the, even the old ones that were in a much more dilapidated state modular ones there did get repurposed to another nonprofit when these units were put in. Um, and so we fully intend over the next year to figure that out and get them uh, used somewhere. So, and, and for a charitable purpose. Um, but first dibs, you know, it's gonna go to where we work with city and county staff on it. Uh, so on other questions, um, and so, uh, you know, I'll have to lean on staff then, given the fact that these are not used as support, as permanent housing, so there's not a tenant relationship with anyone that's there. They're program participants, like in the shelters, and, and uh, but in transitional housing there, so there's not a landlord-tenant relationship. And, and to say, like, we're not gonna remove anyone from this housing, uh, move any participants in order to do this project. Everyone who's participating in that program is time limited, and, that, and the program and the federal funding that has come in has those time limits. So we're going to exit folks as they exit to housing, to other uh, shelters, et cetera, as they would normally and just not fill new participants into that and then move on toward executing the, <coughs> excuse me, this project. So there's not gonna be somebody, there are literally not gonna be individuals who are displaced. Um, but however the requirements are supposed to be applied to this, obviously um, 
you know, it seems like it would be six units, but it's 40 individual beds and it's not been permanent housing. Somebody is going to have to tell me how that applies. Um, <clears throat> real quickly, I wanted to emphasize a couple other things. Um, one, you know, this is for folks not only who are chronically homeless, but a portion of the chronic homeless population that really needs significant services on a daily basis. So we've been very successful. I've been from day one involved with the 180 initiative um, to help address chronic homelessness in Santa Cruz County. We've now helped a thousand individuals, you know, into permanent housing who've been chronically homeless across the county. Um, and we know we see what succeeds and what fails. And uh, and um, really, we need housing that has a bunch of services in the building. And that's not most folks who are homeless. It's not even most folks who are chronically homeless. But it's the right answer for some folks either for a period of time or permanently. All this that we're permitting, yes, these are per, it's permanent supportive housing. This is a landlord-tenant relationship, and uh, folks can be tenants there for you know as long as it's right for them and they want to be. So, um, so that's who this is for. We've learned from these buildings uh, literally uh, all over the country. I've toured many of them, asked a lot of questions, gotten operational plans from buildings across the country and up and down the west coast uh, on this and so that's informed our design and our plan and ultimately it's going to be owned and operated completely by uh, housing matters and they currently have a team of over 15 case managers providing uh, services directly to this population and they're going to continue to expand that team to provide the services in the building and pair with county staff at hphp and other service providers um, so we're all, you know, that's part of the whole planning uh, for this as well, is how all those services work. One more thing is I want to say, uh, aside from this uh, formal planning process, we're working to go well beyond code to make this one of the most sustainable and healthiest buildings in Santa Cruz. We're looking at being one of the first uh, passive house apartment buildings in California, um, which means extremely low energy use and also control of the air. We recognize that for, from fire events and air quality from those to the location of this building next to a highway and um, industrial uses, we're serving a vulnerable population here. We want this to be a very healthy building. So we're lo looking at implementing the reset air standard, which is a very high standard for controlling the air quality and, uh, and not having materials that are off-gassing, you know, et cetera. So I just wanted to note that we're, we have a whole other lane on this project working on sustainability with some experts um, from around the country as well as our great architects at David Baker Architects and the modular factory we're considering using uh, Factory OS. And we're looking for this to be really be a model of how um, it doesn't have to be too costly, especially in the long run, to create a very sustainable building. Um, I Very quickly, uh, Commissioner Spellman had the question about FAR, and I did understand that question, and I wanted to say the answer to it because I've puzzled over this parcel so long. I have the answer, which is that it really comes from the fact this parcel is landlocked and back from the street, and so you got to have a fire turnaround, and it's not a rectangle. It's a funky shape, you know, with an angle and stuff like that. So you just can't quite get to the maximum FAR. If this was a nice rectangle that was on a major thoroughfare, like right directly on, you know, River Street, South of Highway 1 or something, a base density could be at the, toward the top end of the FAR, and then you could use bonus above that. But other site constraints, I think, got in the way of that in this case. Um, and then my last note is that, uh, well, I was going to say that based on the public comment that came in, we did do, do the noise study uh, in the construction time period. And on a particularly noisy day, our noise uh, what it, uh, acoustic analyst, that's what you say, was, was very excited about all the noise um, and, uh, and the train and everything else. We tried to catch all of that. And, uh, you know, it's part of what we're doing with the design of this in order to make energy efficient building. You know, we're looking at triple pane windows and doing a lot of things around, you know, noise for the uh, residents and uh, uh, both between apartments so that people can coexist in small units like this, as well as recognizing it's in a, a somewhat noisy uh, place within the city. Then the last thing I was going to say is on the affordability restrictions, there's some confusion that um, was caused, I think, by me in part, uh, which is that um, we... This is going to be 
this use. It's going to be permanent supportive housing, permanently owned by Housing Matters, you know, nonprofit with this focus, which really means all or essentially all of the residents are going to be extremely low income. Um, but we're trying to privately finance this. We've raised $6 million um, for this project to date, and most of the cost, it's about a $25 million project, can be debt finance against uh, vouchers, rental subsidy vouchers for these uh, clients. And so we're well on our way to putting together the financing without um, using public dollars. We are pursuing, though, fee waivers from the city of Santa Cruz and the various districts. It's complicated. We're getting great help uh, from um, staff on that. And uh, so water district, school district, you know, et cetera, and seeing if we can get enough fee waivers, um, even though there's some costs that come along with that. And, uh, and so the fee waivers require all the units to be very low income restricted. Um, and so that's why uh, we had to apply one p time for the planning app and the fee waivers. So we said, well, if we can get these fee waivers, we can restrict all these units at very low income. But because of financing and trying to underwrite the loan and stuff, it would be helpful mm -hmm. to us if we don't go the fee waiver route to say, um, yes, some of these have to be very low income because of the inclusionary ordinance, fine. If there's replacement housing requirements on that, fine. Those are in per per perpetuity, fine. But the majority of the units would be just restricted at low income, which is what's required by AB 1763 slash bonus density law. Even though, again, it's going to be the same use uh, if we can have most of the units restricted at low income. If we're not doing the fee waivers, it'll help our debt, uh, potentially help our debt underwriting. So that was complicated, but I'm hoping the condition of approval for our planning application reflects that accurately, those different um, income restriction requirements, and then when we go to city council around the fee waivers, that could potentially add an additional uh, income restriction. Okay, is that, that concludes your uh, presentation? Yeah, that was my list of comments. I hope that was all right, but I'm happy to take any other questions, of course. Um, okay, is there anybody else on the line that would like to testify on this um, on this item? This yes, uh, Chair, this is the clerk. There are several um, people who have indicated that they want to speak, and I'm going to go down the line. For the rest of you that are on the line that have not raised your clerk, hands. Uh, oh. Can you hear from the clerk on this, please? Sorry, Chair, I... Forgot to unmute myself. <laughs> uh, there are several people on the line. For those of you who are on the line that have not yet raised your hands, please do so by pressing star nine to get in the queue uh, because there's somewhat of a lag in the, um, in the way that we broadcast this. So we want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard. So I'll uh, start with the first speaker. Last four numbers, 4091. Sorry, that was Sibley. That was me when I was dialing in to listen, so you can skip that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, speaker 4976 are the last four numbers. You can unmute yourself, and you have up to three minutes to testify. Hi, can you can hear me all right? This is Hi, yes. this is Phil Kramer, Executive Director from Housing Matters. Go ahead. Great. Welcome. Thank you. Well, Sibley covered uh, a lot of what I was going to say, um, but I did want to speak to uh, just as we use the term chronic homelessness and the folks that, uh, that this project is designed for, um, that really you know, are individuals in our community who have been unsheltered or homeless for a long period of time or that have had multiple episodes of being unsheltered or homeless. And I think a really important component to this, uh, to understand really the definition of chronic homelessness, is that also experiencing a disabling condition, right? Some type of physical, mental, or other impairment. And these folks uh, who have been unsheltered or homeless for a long time and meet this definition are in our community and really don't have other workable housing solutions. Um, 
They're not successful living independently in the community, yet they don't qualify for skilled nursing, and they really slip through the cracks of our system of care in the community. And so this type of housing, long-term permanent uh, housing with leases in their name, with on-site case management, on-site support to help them succeed and thrive in their housing placement is, you know, a proven best practice model that's used in communities throughout the country. And we have an opportunity here on our campus uh, to, uh, to provide this housing solution for those folks uh, that really don't have any other workable solution. The other thing I'd, I'd mention is that, um, you know, the county is just rolling out their housing for health plan right now, their three-year strategic plan focused on, uh, on solutions to homelessness and permanent supportive housing is identified in that plan, plan actually with uh, an identified target or benchmark number of 100 permanent supportive housing units. So um, we understand that uh, we can help the county uh, and the, our community reach that goal uh, and exceed that goal with this uh, one project uh, alone. And I'll just wrap it up there and, uh, and also make myself available for any comments, any questions. Thank you very much. Other people on the line? Hey, um, good evening, Commissioners. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Just give us a name, please. We have up to three minutes. All right, my name is Sam Deutsch. I'm actually a resident in San Francisco, um, but I was alerted to this project um, just because I care, I'm a renter and I care a lot about housing, especially housing for the most vulnerable in our community. And also because housing is not an issue that's confined just to one city. Um, San Francisco's housing crisis impacts Santa Cruz and vice versa. and um, I'm just calling in in strong support of this project. Anytime that we can um, get homes built for um, the people who need the most, who are on the streets, who are suffering from um, impairments and other issues, um, I really think it's a no-brainer. But I also think that um, given the context here, um, this will be really great for the community and it'll provide um, an actual supportive solution to what's obviously um, a major issue throughout um, California. So I, I strongly support the project and hope that it's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other speakers? Yes, Chair. Yeah, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Identify yourself and you have up to uh, three minutes, please. All right. Uh, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Pat Mapelli. I'm the Land Use Manager for Granite Rock uh, Company. Uh, we are the uh, concrete and building material supply company uh, immediately adjacent or separated by about 40 feet of rail spur uh, between um, this location, the 119 and, and our operation. Um, first, I'd like to just uh, applaud Santa Cruz for taking steps to um, house those that are most vulnerable. Um, you know, we operate in several different facilities between Monterey Bay and the San Francisco Bay, and we see this um, all around um, in every city that we operate. So, um, and 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 we also see a lot of uh, these types of of uses starting to pop up immediately adjacent to industrial uses. And, and it starts to beg the question, are we putting these most vulnerable people in the right places? Um, you know, for, for Granite Rock, you know, we're a, a longtime company established in 1900. Everything we do takes a long-term vision. You know, we California contractor license number 22. It's the second oldest in the state. So everything we do that we invest in is for the long term. Um, so when we talk about long term uses and, and, and adjacent uses, we get concerned about what people might think is transitional or long term versus what we think is long term, which obviously is decades long. Um, I, I, I do, I do as, as a land, as a person who deals with land use. Um, for Granite Rock, I do question um, 
whether or not really we're intended to put to these types of land uses adjacent to each other. Um, you know, we're basically a heavy industry and um, this is permanent housing. And, you know, I'm not saying don't build your project. Uh, I, I think it's a worthy project to consider. I, I do ask that we look at our operations and wanting to be in Santa Cruz and serve the region with the construction materials that it's much needed, um, that we don't get ourselves into a situation where we get pressure because of the change in a use uh, adjacent to us. Um, and, and that makes it hard for industries to, to do business anywhere. And, and so, you know, if, should you guys move forward with this project, um, just please keep Granite Rock in mind, keep our use in mind. Um, we're, we're positioned where we are strategically because the city wanted us there and we want to be there. Uh, and we, we just don't want to be under additional pressures in the future. So um, with that in mind, the last thing I'll close with is I still question the open space on the fifth floor kind of overlooking Granite Rock operation. It seems like there's a, a, a probably a better facing location to put people's uh, outdoor space, um, maybe to enjoy the view towards the bay, um, towards the, the, the setting sun, rather than towards a concrete plant. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Is there anybody else um, that wants to testify on this uh, matter? I see uh, an Adam Buchbinder. Unmute yourself. Uh, Hello. You and you have up to three minutes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Adam Bookbinder. I'm a planning commissioner for the city of Campbell, though here I'm speaking only for myself. This is a crucially necessary project, replacing a small number of temporary homes with a much larger number of permanent homes desperately needed, given the horrors of chronic homelessness. I'd like to thank the developer for proposing this project, which will help so many residents of Santa Cruz, especially for locating it in such a walkable area and providing amenities like a roof deck. I have no objection to reorienting that deck as long as it doesn't delay these homes. We need so much more of this. I cannot endorse this strongly enough. Thank you for your time. I yield the balance. Thank you very much. Is there, I, it looks like we have somebody else, uh, Kyle Kelly. Uh, you're unmuted. Uh, identify yourself. You have up to three minutes. Welcome. Hey, thank you. This is Kyle Kelly. Uh, I live in Santa Cruz. Uh, you're going to hear a baby while I'm talking because I'm trying to take care of one. Um, right. So I just wanted to call in strong support of the project. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, the other, the only thing that I want to look at this is how can we help streamline uh, more projects like this? I mean, like, this is the kind of thing that, that seems like it, it should be by right and that shouldn't have to go through nearly as much process uh, to help get extremely needed housing. Um, that's, the, that's the only thing that I have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to testify on this matter? I see another person. Uh, do you identify yourself and you have up to three minutes? Welcome. Hello, uh, my name is Evan Siroki. I live in Scotts Valley, and I support the project. I feel that there is an extreme shortage of housing uh, for all types of people in the county. And uh, while I uh, do uh, think that there could be a better site for people to sleep uh, that's not next to an industrial area, that you know this proposal is uh, here before us tonight, and we got to take every opportunity that we can to address the uh, chronic need for housing. And I would wish that uh, this project would uh, be approved, and uh, frankly, that we wouldn't need to have a meeting about this project that would just be automatically approved. And so I urge other leaders to consider uh, uh, future projects like these to be uh, approvable by right and without uh, need of having planning commission meetings or city council meetings. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else? Yeah, no. 
another person, please identify yourself, and you have up to three minutes. Welcome. Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, my name is Robert Singleton, uh, former planning commissioner for the city. I uh, just want to encourage you all tonight to support this project and please move it forward. Uh, it's a huge need in our community and one that we hardly ever get the opportunity to, to address in such a meaningful and, and, and big way with being able to supply this many units and this kind of an opportunity. Um, to do it with such a valuable uh, partner that, uh, as Housing Matters, who have so much expertise already in being able to fulfill this mission, I think uh, there isn't a better place and a better partner you could work with to get this mission done and get these housing units built. So please move forward with this project. Um, the last comment I'll make, uh, I think, is watching earlier hearing uh, Commissioner Spellman's comments uh, regarding the density and the need for the density bonus to even get to that max density. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter, but I think you might have been alluding to kind of the reflective nature of do we need a density bonus to even make it feasible to get a project at that level? Uh, if this is the density that we're trying to encourage, perhaps we need to look at our own code to see if we can fix things to make a project that is already this dense make it work. So, um, uh, again, please move forward with the project. Thanks for your time tonight, um, and thank you, uh, Sibley, for all you do and for all the work you're doing to bring more housing to Santa Cruz and do it in a way that has a unique financing model so that we can save our valuable public money for other affordable housing. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? I see another person who seems to be coming online. Identify yourself and you'll have up to three minutes. Hi, my name is Tim Gordon and I just want to call in in support of this project. Um, there's, you know, location is, is what we have here. And so if it's next to Granite Rock, you know, I would say that hopefully we can look past that. It would seem unfortunate to me that we put <clears throat> the idea of, you know, building supply and material company, which we all appreciate, especially at these times, but in front of the idea of homeless supportive housing. Um, it's such a critical need, as we all know, in this city, uh, that I think that it shouldn't be a, a question where it goes. I think we just need it anywhere. Um, on top of that, Something that the applicant mentioned that is probably a little underestimated or undervalued is the idea of a passive house building. So passive house is super energy efficient, very clean. Um, the air exchange rate is very low, and what it creates is the ability of just very clean, healthy environment for the people living there. So you couldn't ask for a better building to be built in the country, especially when it's next to a, a you know, a granite creek or a granite rock, excuse me, or something similar um, next to the freeway. You know, this is the type of building that we should be pushing forward and, and we'll, we'll see a lot more of in the future. Um, I think this project is perfect. It's great. Um, and it should just be approved as is. Let them build this project so we can move forward <clears throat> with helping the situation um, and take steps forward as opposed to playing the waiting game. So <clears throat> I appreciate you all. Thanks for your time. And uh, thanks for all you do for us. And uh, please approve this project. Thanks. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Looks like we have another speaker. Go ahead. Is Hello. My name is Elizabeth Conlin. Um, I'm a resident of the um, city of Santa Cruz. And I just wanted to voice my uh, strong support for this project. I really appreciate how thoughtful the applicant has been about the location and some of the constraints that might be faced um, being next to uh, an industrial area. I'd also like to um, agree with earlier commenters that a project like this should be approved by right, and I hope you will look into making it easier for projects like this to be expedited in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else? Uh, there are several people on the line. There are no other speakers that have indicated they wish to address the board. If there are any speakers That's that... the clerk, if there's anybody else waiting. There are no other uh, members of the public that have raised their hand. If there are members of the public that wish to address the commission, please press star nine now. There are several other people listening to the hearing.
I don't see any uh, members of the public. No one else. Um, uh, uh, no one else wants to testify. I'm going to close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. I, I, I actually would like to ask a question of the developer, Mr. Simon. Uh, I'd like to get ask him to respond to the. Um, issue raised by the uh, Granite Rock representative regarding the location of the open area and um, how difficult it would be to move or what do you think about moving it or uh, I, I just want to get your response to that concern. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I want to say, you know, we absolutely think this can be compatible. We don't think this will provide any pressure on Granite Rock, but we absolutely and, and when I say we, especially myself and Phil Kramer, who's Executive Director of Housing Matters, would love to meet with Granite Rock and get into detail on any concerns and make sure we're compatible. Um, so we're always open to ideas and absolutely want, want that. Um, I know this isn't what you're asking, but I think a, a key point is, as far as the overall location of this project is concerned, this is out of the entire Santa Cruz County, this is the place with the nexus of services already in existence needed for this housing. So the county health care clinic being the you know, number one thing and, uh, and um, housing matters case management team based here, the security that's already there for the campus, everything from AA meetings to you know, dentistry that happens there already and on and on in the super care center itself, which will be a, a, I a key. I all the information, so, but the question was really about yeah, the specific. Just the deck. Yeah, it is facing west right now, so it is is the sunset direction. Um, and the problem is we are to make this building affordable to build and with a really high quality uh, job. We're using plan to use modular construction, and so the the only way to situate the building is east west as it is, and then the modules that get built in a factory run north south on this. And so you stack them along the building. And so, you know, we'd have to look in more depth whether it could go on the other end. But the problem is that for emergency exit on a stairway, you know, there's a reason we put the uh, emergency exit stairway on the other end, which put the deck on this end. So there's a lot of detailed site constraints. It's not obvious to me that it could be moved in any, direct, in any way. But, you know, I'd have to dive into it. Okay, well, I just wanted to get your response. Thanks. It seems, uh, what I'm hearing you saying is that practically it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to really move it, given the nature of the construction. Um, I wanted, before I open up to other commissions, I wanted to follow up on the affordable housing uh, end of it. And um, ask the staff, it sounds like from the testimony that there are six dwelling units on the site. They may be 40 beds, but really the replacement housing ordinance applies to dwelling units. I just wanted to clarify that the concern isn't with the affordability of the project. I understand, uh, and I, 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 and Steph can correct me on this as well. I don't see, you know, there's no requirement uh, beyond whatever was, whatever the uh, density bonus requirements would be for very low income. Um, as far as I'm concerned, if they're if they're 100 percent low income and as many very low income as possible, uh, that's fine. My concern is in the length of time they're going to be affordable. I'm not going to be here in 40 uh, in 55 years, but I know the city has had problems with projects that were built 30 and even uh, longer ago when their requirement runs out, um, even with uh, nonprofit groups, it can be problematic to retain the re affordability. So from my perspective, um, to the extent it's possible that they'd all be 100%, um, it would be 100% affordable in perpetuity, I think that's really would be the most desirable. And I think as a minimum, we should get that for the replacement units but I'm, I'd also be supportive of a recommendation to the council, if I'm understanding correctly, that the council waive fees with, with the requirement that all the units be affordable in perpetuity. I think it's worth it to um, reduce the short-term 
revenue to have that long-term assurance of affordability. So let me just check with staff whether my understanding about the replacement housing uh, requirements is, uh, is correct or not. Or Mr. Bain, who wants to answer? I would defer I to Mr. Wood on that. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, we understand your concern, Chair, and that is what we've been talking to the applicant about is if the applicant is requesting a fee waiver, then the city would, you know, would like to have those units. In, a, in affordable in perpetuity. So that, you know, 100% of the units that are being um, subsidized with with city, city money, basically. Um, so I think I was looking for Sibley on the phone, or on the line, but um, we have been going back and forth and we talked again today. Um, so, so this is an approach that we're looking at, but we aren't there. You know, this has to go to council. So it's, I don't know if this right. is a forum for us to, uh, I mean, certainly staff could recommend that to council. What about the replacement housing requirement? So again, if, if those six units are considered dwelling units, then, then yes, there is a replacement requirement. Oh, and whether that's in perpetuity or not, I, it's for sure 55 years based on the state density law. Um, and I was looking at our affordable housing provision. I've got it up right now. Uh, the 2416-2222, the replacement housing requirements doesn't specify a time frame, um, uh, but, but it is at least 55 years based on the state um, density bonus. Um, so the commission could uh, recommend to add a condition that would cover the, since we've gotten testimony that they do have kitchens in them, kitchenettes in them, that they would um, be a six unit replacement housing requirement and with a recommendation that it be in perpetuity. Um, and also the commission could recommend to the council that they waive with the understanding that all the affordable units would stay affordable. The commission does have the ability to make those recommendations, does it not? So the, um, the uh, replacement housing ordinance um, does provide that um, those replacement units are affordable in perpetuity. Um, you'll, you'll recall from our discussion on the Seabright project, there is a provision in the code that allows um, the inclusionary units to also serve as the replacement housing units. Um, I know there was a position that your commission took that because of the use of the term may, that there was some discretion there and you had um, accordingly recommended that they not be double dipped. So that's, that's one thing you might want to deliberate on. But uh, to answer your question, um, the replacement housing uh, units according to our ordinance do need to remain affordable in perpetuity. Okay, thank you. I I'm sorry I jumped in first. Other commissioners would like to comment on this uh, on uh, on this project. Commissioner Dawson, see your hand up, and then Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. I, I certainly could go on about this project, um, how exciting it is. Um, I think that some of the components that are most exciting to me um, include just the, the quality of the housing that's going to be provided and the quality of the services. Um, so um, I also wanted to just thank uh, staff for the report. I really uh, appreciated the table that laid out uh, the open space requirements and, the, um, and, and how those were going to be met or exceeded. Um, I, I always like to see that those open space requirements exceeded and, and where we can still get um, housing units. Uh, so that's great. Um, and, you know, I think the important thing that I just want to bring up and emphasize is that this is a proof of concept that 
there are creative ways to both finance and build 100% affordable and get it to pencil out and get it to work in Santa Cruz right now. And I just want to thank the developers for this um, and just encourage people out in the ether to continue to do this work and continue to be um, come up with projects like this and bring them forward because we can build 100% affordable housing in this town, and I hope we see more projects like this, and I am enthusiastically supportive of this project. Um, last thing I'll say is I would like to see some conditions around affordability being in perpetuity. You know, I would like to think of this Santa Cruz long after I'm gone uh, as um, a place that supports economic diversity, and a project like this, having affordable units in perpetuity could do that. So if other commissioners are supportive of that. Um, it would be great if someone uh, could move that forward. Thank you. Commissioner Spellman. Yeah, I would echo a lot of those comments as well. Um, yeah, the enthusiasm around this project is obvious. Um, everyone calling in is in support of this project. Um, the synergy of the ownership and already the symbiosis of the community that this uh, development surrounds is just really strong. Um, you know, the developers going above and beyond with the quality of project that they're bringing to the table uh, for a 100% affordable project. You know, these are the kind of projects our city needs. You know, it would take five projects of similar scale to get the same number of units uh, affordable in our community. So these projects, when they come, are the ones that, you know, really up the ante as far as our affordable uh, component goes. Um, and I also think that, you know, the design, we're also reviewing a, a design permit tonight. This, this project, you know, although it's somewhat simple, right, it's a bar building, um, stacked units, small repetitive SRO units, um, but if you if you take a step back and look at the, the intricacies of the site plan, for example, and the ground floor plan, I love the idea that the uses are are mixed. This isn't a, a housing project here that isn't mingling and collaborating with the clinic next door. Um, the building is able to be traversed a, around its entirety. And I think the renderings that were presented sort of enhanced that idea, right? The, the open spaces that are around it are going to be used by people living there, people coming there to use the clinic facilities, people that work there. And it, in, in a very small area creates a very dynamic, I think, inter, interchange between uh, the people that will be using this facility. So I think in some very small ways, there's some very sophisticated uh, moves here that really are going to make this, you know, a special place. Um, virtue of the highway condition and having the big sound wall next to it almost creates this sort of private enclave uh, behind behind the wall, so to speak. But I think there's, you know, a lot of small moves here that are that are very smart and and are done well. Um, I do actually like the location of, of the deck uh, overlooking granite, granite Rock. I mean, it's really not Granite Rock they're looking over. It's really the long views up the Pogo Nip and, and, and to the west. Um, it does beg the question in general on this sort of rub between industrial land and residential uses. Um, the city has held on pretty tight to their industrial space in the past, and you know we can't deny that there's just such a high need for the residences here. I think what what the projects that I've been familiar with, where they've been residential uses in the industrial zone or adjacent to it, I guess this is still technically community commercial. Um, there's some sort of a acknowledgement to the people living in these facilities that, yes, you are living in proximity to, you know, industrial uses that have, quite frankly, different um, restrictions on them than would, for example, residential neighborhoods. 
right? Industrial zones can have stuff that might not be as good for people or the environment at different levels than other areas within the city. So I think it's important to, to make that acknowledgement and make sure that everybody's going into this, you know, with eyes wide open. Uh, I'm pretty sure there are some requirements um, to be made to that effect uh, to, to people living in this zone. And maybe staff can address that at some point. Um, the fact that the developer is going for a passive approved project is, again, a very significant um, piece to this puzzle. Uh, it just goes to show you that, you know, our most vulnerable and our supposedly cheapest housing can still be at an extremely high quality. Um, and I want to commend them for, for, for taking that route. One, for hiring a quality team to bring this project forward and uh, to go the extra mile to pay that attention uh, to this development. Um, and I think, you know, the building is what it is. And I think the use of, you know, let's call it unique materials um, and the way fenestration is oriented, I think this is going to be a very attractive uh, addition to, you know, entering into our town. And, there, and there's also something profound about, you know, we're now having the ability to house people that, you know, currently are inhabiting around that site that, that don't have homes. Um, this, this image I, I keep seeing of, you know, a place, a place to live versus, you know, along the road, so to speak. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited about this project and it's, um, it's, it's great to see it happening. And I do want to, you know, challenge the commission uh, moving forward, right? This, several speakers have brought this point up about, you know, how do we approve projects by right that are similar to this type of a project? And I don't have an answer for that tonight, but, you know, these are significant um, ideas and challenges that we face. And if there are ways that we can, um, you know, fast track projects like this, I think obviously we should spend the time to see how we can make that happen. That's all I've got. Thanks. Uh, other commissioners, uh, Commissioner Conway, uh, your comments, please. Yeah. And Commissioner Greenberg. Okay. Thank you, Chair Schiffman. Um, so first of all, I would like to say to Sibley just a really hearty congratulations. I know you've been working on this for a long time. I think this um, project is um, amazing, and I know what a heavy lift it is. So thank you very much, and congratulations on getting it this far. Um, I was uh, planning on sort of separating questions for the developer and then comments uh, for uh a recommendation, so it may mush in there together and I may need to return. But I also want to really um, thank the people who took the time to testify in support of this project. Um, it is a really important project. and But um, some of the concerns, I think, are worth addressing. And one of them is about the expedited processing and a by-right approval. Um, this The process for this project is about as expedited as I would want it to be, frankly. Um, I'm, I'm glad that there's a lot of thresholds. The state has taken a lot of choices away from jurisdictions, and that's, that is um, for good reason, a good and solid reason. On the other hand, this public discussion, this is the way that the community gets to both embrace this project and also try to make it better, um, try to ask its questions, um, condition it in a way that looks long-term and ensures that it is going to meet a community need in the long run. So this is expedited processing. I'm in favor of it. I think there are some things that we can do tonight, um, and we can ask some questions and ask some things of this project. And I plan on doing my best uh, to, to do that. Um, the other thing that I want to raise, I want to thank Mr. Mapelli from Granite Rock for, um, first of all, being willing to support this project, 
but also um, raising the issue of residential uses adjacent to industrial uses. Um, a city can't be helpful if it or, you, or healthy if it doesn't have a range of economic opportunities and meet a whole range of needs. Industrial uses are terribly important for that. Um, there's a long history nationwide of um, uh, an, a long-standing industrial use has a residential use put next to it pretty soon. I, don't, I'm not, I do not at all believe this is going to happen here. But just to be aware of how reasonable his concerns are, the next thing you know, all of a sudden, wait a minute, There's a they, they make concrete over there? We don't want that. And um, there ends up being a loss of industrial land. Um, that's bad for the city. It's bad for the community. And I don't hear... Um, Mr. Mapelli saying that he thinks that's going to happen, and I certainly don't hear um, the developer thinking that that is the way that this is going to go. Um, but it isn't unreasonable um, to uh, raise that concern, and I think it is incumbent on us, uh, meaning the planning commission, and then as it's uh, making recommendations to the council, to also think long term. Um, this is a big building; it's a significant change. Of course, it's meeting a dire need that um, we are all very grateful it is. But we do need to think about um, what it means to have an approval of a significant building like this in the long term. I had a set of questions that mostly were answered through the discussion, um, and one of them was um, the uh, developer's relationship with the landowner. Um, it seems like um, New Way Homes is not going to be the owner of this property um, in order to develop it. And I imagine it's going to be held as an LLC, or um, I would like to ask that question of Sibley, um, how is the land held um, and who will be holding it? I did not also, until um, uh, Phil spoke, I didn't realize that Housing Matters was going to be a long-term owner of the property, or which it is now. Um, so um, I guess that makes some sense. I am wondering about uh, is there a third-party property management company managing a 120-unit building um, for any population is a complicated thing to take on, um, and maybe, or is Housing Matters planning on, you know, growing its capacity as a property manor, manager in that way. Um, I am interested in a uh, seeing a management plan and also a services plan. Um, I can tell that it's actually pretty evolved. Um, I could tell that from the conversation. Um, I feel like it is a reasonable thing for the city to um, ask to um, sign off to know that that exists and to sign off on it, obviously not in order to tinker with it um, at great depth, but to um, be able to review and ensure that there really is um, a substantial services plan, that there's funding for those services, which are notoriously hard to predict into the future, but you can demonstrate where they are. Um, the fact that funding is fickle um, is um, one of the reasons why the existing transitional housing project is closing. That's no longer the model of choice. So, um, you know, being able to plan for the provision of those services and know that they're stable is something that is absolutely key to the permanent supportive housing model. And um, I'd like to ask that uh, both a services plan be submitted to the city and also a property management plan. Um, as part of that property management plan, I am interested in what is the plan for parking. Um, I'm also um, I, I am in support of our inability to demand more parking um, for the residences. Nonetheless, we know that parking is extremely complicated on that corner, and I would be interested in knowing um, that there, that there is a plan for parking. How is it going to be used? What are the, um, what is the property manager, the property owner planning on doing, um, with residents with cars? Um, I don't think you can just ban, um, can't discriminate against car owners. Um, 
And uh, so just what, are, what is the plan around that? Um, so, that, so those are those pieces. Another long-term issue that I am wondering about is the um, financing. I'm also enthusiastic about um, a, a different model of financing this project, and I really, um, I'm, I've spent some time in the past talking with Sibley about this. Um, but I, this is a big building, 120 units. You're delivering affordability to an extremely low-income population, some of whom are even below extremely low, I mean, which would be defined as affordable at 30% of area median income. Um, people without SSI may well be well below that. Um, so I understand that the plan for achieving affordability is through tenant-based vouchers, um, I hope you're planning on getting some, or I don't know if you are not, planning on getting any um, project-based um, subsidy to the, to the site at all, or I guess that's a question. Um, I do think in the long term um, you're relying on a uh, source that is um, uh, pickle and it changes over time. And um, I wonder about if, whether you've been able to uh, raise the bank financing um, because of that. Um, so that's one of the concerns that I have long, long term. I also, when I look at this project, I think about, well, if the idea of a 100% um, privately financed project doesn't pan out, then I, I look at it as a more traditional affordable housing project that would be going for um, the sources that we're you know, more used to seeing, whether it be low-income housing tax credits or any of the different, um, any of the state financing options. Um, so when I first looked at it, I thought, well, um, how is that going to work? Uh, long, if, if we don't end up, if you're, if you're not able to raise the money privately, um, I just had to ask myself, how well will this building compete um, for public dollars? So it's a question that I have um, whether or not you've you know, been looking at sort of a parallel universe on that it was a question. And then the, the way that those long-term questions are usually answered in an affordable housing project is a market study. I know it sounds a little bit funny in a project like this, to um, wonder if we have the market for it. I think we all know we have an overwhelming need um, for this type of housing. But a market study um, might have you look at it over the long term. Um, what does it look like? Um, what does the financing look like in 20 years? How is it carrying debt? How is it servicing its um, and, and uh, maintaining itself to ensure that the building is viable for um, the 55 years that I guess it won't have public financing, but at least for the term of the loan, typically how that's looked at. Um, so, and then I had one more comment, and I'm trying to wrap it all up at once instead of a couple segments. Um, so this project is embedded on a campus that um, provides a wide range of services, as has been mentioned a few times. Um, I know there's also been talk um, over the years of um, uh, potentially expanding at some point in the future, and I do hope that all of the all of the participants um, down on the campus are involved in master planning, both in any changes that are going on down there, but also um, if there's going to be any expansion. Um, so I, I guess that's it for now, and I think we'll probably come back and talk more about recommendations on affordability. Do you want me to just sure. try to succinctly answer a few of those things? Uh, sure. No. Um, oh, okay. Before Sorry. the commission right now, let's wait until we hear from all the commissioners before okay. we um, have dialogue. Commissioner Greenberg. <clears throat> so, yes. Um, Thank you to my fellow commissioners for all of the comments and to Commissioner Conway for the questions, and I, I'm interested to hear um, responses to that. But I would, um, 
I would echo the support of this innovative approach um, at a time when at the federal level it's very hard to get financing for affordable housing um, and the uh, recognition of the urgent need for it in our city, in our county, in that location, um, and echoing Commissioner Spellman on, on the significance of that location and, you know, what it means for folks who are currently living unhoused um, in, you know, on that corner. And uh, the fact that it's really a beautiful building, that it's, uh, a passive house, that it's exemplary um, in terms of its sustainability credentials. And that's true, I think, for the building itself as well as what it means for, you know, providing a model of density uh, for the city and hoping that that is extended into the downtown area and beyond, that, you know, we can have in sale dense affordable housing and that can have sustainable benefits for our city and region as a whole. Um, and, you know, looking at the degree to which it will cut down on trips and so forth and um, produce greenhouse gas emission reductions and so forth is on a, on a larger geographic scale is something that um, I also really um, applaud. Uh, the fact that it's working in such close partnership with Housing Matters, that it's following a housing first approach and recognizing the long term social benefits that that's going to have um, for this community as well as for our larger city and county um, and the potential for this to mean a real pathway um, into another uh, into another life situation for residents and ability to contribute and, and be part of our community um, for, for folks living in, in this housing is modeled around the country and the world, and I'm really happy that we are going to be part of that movement. Uh, and uh, I would say that, um, you know, it's really um, heartening to also have all of the folks who called in and the, and the support for this project, um, which, is, which is so widespread. Uh, and, uh, you know, just to say that it's... Um, Potentially a uh, a new a new moment really for the city, um, you know, uh, and and for for our region that we're making this move, and really appreciate. Uh, and I think that this is something that people around the city, around the, around the Bay Area, the fact that we had someone calling in from San Francisco, um, you know, recognizing that this is a broad regional issue that that oftentimes you know, people don't have a chance to weigh in on the significance of this and the impact of, that this is going to have on a much larger scale. And so to thank um, Sibley Simon and Housing First for really um, for really uh, advancing this um, over multiple years uh, and, you know, creating potentially a model for our entire region is something that, um, you know, I really wanted to... to appreciate um, and uh, to know that there isn't the kind of opposition that has existed in the past, quite honestly, for these kinds of projects is, uh, is something that's very, is very heartening for me. Um, and, you know, I'm interested to hear their responses to Commissioner Conway in terms of the issues around financing, and um, I recognize that this is an innovative approach, uh, and, uh, but hopeful that nonetheless it can be pursued and that we can achieve this um, as, as quickly as possible. I'm interested in these questions around by right. I, I would echo um, Commissioner Spellman in saying I would love for the Commission to discuss this in the future, what it would mean, for instance, in a location where, um, you know, it, uh, that is more in a residential area, for instance, like what it means to have a kind of by right approach, how that might expedite things. Um, at the same time that I hear what Commissioner Conway is saying about the importance of having the community weigh in and efforts to, uh, you know, opportunities to improve the, the um, project proposal uh, and to consider all kinds of different perspectives in that. So I'm interested in having that discussion. I think that's a really important one. And I, I appreciate that being brought up also by the public. 
anyway, I'm very excited. I really thank you all for the work you've done in bringing this to us. I congratulate you. Um, and this is really a high point personally for me um, on this commission getting to weigh in on this project. So thank you. Before um, we, uh, we sort of ask for a response to some of the con questions that Commissioner Conway raised, I want to ask the staff whether it is legitimately for us to discuss things like the services plan or the financing plan. This is a land use uh, issue, and it has to do, it's not a supportive housing issue. It, these are single family, you know, this is an SRO project, and I'm not sure, you know, our concern is really a land use concern. I can see why it would le be legitimate to ask for a parking plan, especially given the parking issues in the area. But I'm not sure what basis we have for uh, involving ourselves in how the project is going to be financed or uh, how it's going to be managed. It's a, it's a SRO project, um, and I, I don't think we would do this for a normal market rate or even an affordable project, or at least I'm not sure that we should, uh, given our role in terms of managing um, making this, making recommendations about land use. Uh, that's, as I, as I understand it, what's before us is a land use question. Is this an appropriate use at this density with this design uh, at this location? And um, that's, that's our, you know, I think the questions that Commissioner Conway asked are very, very legitimate. Um, they're reasonable questions, and I have similar questions. But I'm not sure it's my business uh, as a planning commissioner to um, try to get the answer to that or somehow have the answer to that affect the decision on whether to recommend approval for the project or not. I think what's before us is really what's in the staff report. And I would like, um, I do think the issue of um, parking is legitimate, even though we can't require parking spaces. I think having an understanding of what the parking, how the parking is going to work on that site is, uh, you know, is, is a reasonable thing to request. I, I would not recommend continuing it at this time, but I think a recommendation to have a parking plan developed at the time it comes before the city council would be a reasonable uh, recommendation to have, uh, to, to make. But in terms of how the services are going to work and how the uh, financing is going to work, I'd be interested in knowing that. But I just, I, I would really ask staff whether that is appropriately something that we can uh, immerse ourselves in. Hey, Chair Schiffer, and this is Samantha from the Current Planning Department. Um, yeah, this, this um, project does include a special use permit, and when we review use permits, we do review, um, we do commonly review the operation of um, the proposed use. And so um, it is, um, you are able to um, ask for those kinds of plans with this project, we believe. So we could ask for a services plan? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And what yeah, about I, the financing of the um, of the project? Is that a legitimate concern that we can raise? Well, I think um, you know, as a rule of thumb um, on conditions of approval for use permits, I mean, really, what we're looking at is um, conditions that address um, the public health, safety, and welfare, and, and as as Hatcher points out, um, we have, we can and do ask for management plans um, all the time that address various things in addition to parking. Um, I think with respect to the, the question of financing, I know there was some discussion from some commissioners regarding, uh, you know, maybe a separate motion on the, uh, the fee waiver, and, and, you know, maybe that might be the place for that should you go that route. Also, one thing I just want to make clear is that this project is being approved here at the Planning Commission. 
it doesn't move on to the city council. The fee waiver is kind of a separate process that will go to the city council, but um, barring an, an appeal or anything, this project that we're talking about tonight will be approved here at the Planning Commission. Oh, I didn't. I missed that. So we're not making a recommendation to the council. We're approving. We're approving the project. Correct. Okay. Oh, great. That would expedite things. Um, so I'll go back to you, Commissioner uh, Conway, and see how you want to. Do you want to ask the applicant for details about the um, services plan and the and the parking plan? We can certainly add a condition that those be provided to the extent it's legitimate at the time of the building permits. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I thought it was possible, but we can certainly yeah. ask that. So yeah. how would you want to, how do you want to deal with it? Yeah, I actually was planning on um, asking to add a condition um, that the um, operator, that, that the owner submit a services plan, which is, completely appropriate. This is a permanent supportive housing project. It does not function without services and it will not be successful. There's tons of studies about that that um, without without those services. Um, so what I would like to do is just ask that there be a you know services plan um, looked at by the city as well as a property management plan. Um, prior to the issuance of a building permit. And I, I have a suggestion that maybe you should uh -huh. make a motion to approve the project um, mm -hmm. as recommended, and then we can, commissioners, yeah. you can add um, conditions, and other commissioners can add conditions either as friendly amendments or we yeah. can vote on, and then that would move this along. Yeah, I was, that's what I, basically what I was planning to do, but I also wanted to clarify that. Um, I don't think that um, the financing per se is a land use matter. But my question was about, and I may have uh, uh, bumbled it up a little bit, but my question was really um, we're, we're making a land use approval that is uh, uh, based on a highly unusual and untested uh, financing model, which I dearly hope is successful. Um, but because we are responsible for looking long term, I just wanted to know if there were, if um, the developer is currently has other ways. Of, have you looked at other things? Is that absolutely the only way you're going to do it? And I guess um, I'm not going to ask the question, what if you can't? I believe you can. I really hope that you can. Um, and, uh, be, you know, because we do need this. But it was really sort of t in terms of looking at it long term and also looking ahead long term, it's a model that assumes funding that may or may not be there. Um, and I think it's reasonable for us to ask as we're making this approval. We're approving very small units for people who have been experiencing chronic homelessness. Um, and it's going to be functional. It's going to be able to pay its operating costs and pay its mortgage on an income assumption. And um, I think it's fair to ask, have you considered? I haven't seen anything about financing. I want to approve. I want, I'm in support of the land use approval, I am concerned about financing and just hope that it's being looked at from a lot of different perspectives. I'd be surprised if it wasn't. Commissioner Dawson? Me too. Yeah, I just, uh, a couple things on the financing. Um, uh, I'll make a comment and then have a question perhaps to my fellow commissioners who have more experience or perhaps to staff. Um, so uh, as many folks, including the developers, said this has been in process for a long time um, and the development of this project and, and the learning from uh, locally, nationally, globally about how to actually get these things done has been part of that process. And so I really, um, I really do want, I, I, I feel very leery about build by right. 
Um, I think it can be done. It can be done correctly. But one of the things that, you know, we continue to tack things onto this, we need this plan and that plan, you know, we're kind of making the case that we're not streamlining this. And I just don't understand the require, like why we as the planning commission um, are involved in this discussion around the financing, because I, I guess this is the question part. If the developer comes to us, gets so far along in a project that if the project comes to us and we approve it, and then the financing comes through, it just falls through, right? So I just don't understand what the repercussions of us not adding more for this developer to do um, are for the city. Um, so if somebody could speak to that, that would be helpful for me because I want to make this as easy as possible. And I just think that there is absolutely no data out there anywhere that supports that these units will always have a body in them, always. There will always be somebody ready to go into one of these units for, I think, as long as there are humans around. So I just don't understand the this kind of tact. Well, look, could I make a suggestion and ask if any of any commissioners willing to make a motion to approve the staff recommendation uh, with the following conditions, that at the time of uh, the project receives permits, that the, uh, the applicant submit a parking plan and a services operational plan, and two, that the um, uh, replacement housing, uh, the replacement housing re, uh, require, affordable requirements be in addition to the inclusionary requirements and they be in perpetuity. And finally, that as a separate action, the commission recommends to the city council that they waive the fees on the condition that all the universe uh, uh, units stay affordable uh, in perpetuity. Is anybody willing to make that motion? Mr. I'd love North. to make that motion just as you stated it. Is there a second? I would second that. Okay, thank you. Um, it's subject to change. I'm just trying to move things along here based on mm -hmm. the conversation that we've had. So the commission, we now have a motion on the floor. Do the commissioners want to speak to the motion or make amendments to it? Commissioner Conway. Yeah, um, I realize I did second it, and I, I am in support of it. I wanted to clarify that the second thing that I was asking for, um, there's a services plan to be submitted, and there's a property management plan to be submitted, which would include a parking plan. Just a little that nuance in how it was stated. Acceptable to the maker of the motion. Uh, yes, I will accept that. So just, um, just, for, just for clarification, so we're, we're asking them for a services plan and we're asking for a separate property management plan that includes the parking. Could you just clarify that one more time, Commissioner? Yeah, Conway? I will. So um, both this, uh, um, if this project ever were to get any public funding, both of those things would absolutely be a requirement. Um, a, a services plan, which I know they already have, they've alluded to it, and I'm sure it's excellent, um, is a very standard thing to pull together, and it's actually a really helpful exercise. And it is absolutely inherent in the whole concept of permanent supportive housing. Um, the other thing is that a property management plan is part of, is a very important part of permanent supportive housing any um, affordable housing project. And once again, it's an exercise of pulling together really the thinking about the long-term operation of that property to make sure that it's successful. Um, this isn't additional hoops to jump through. This certainly isn't um, additional process in terms of a land use approval. Um, so it, and the, a property management plan Sometimes the parking plan stands separately, but it's very reasonable to have it just be part of the same thing. Yeah, I'll absolutely accept that. 
Okay. Um, let me ask uh, Mr. Simon if uh, he has any objection to these, um, the, the amendments that have been made to the staff recommendation. And please just speak to the question. I have no objections at all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does staff have any objections to or any concerns about the amendments to the, uh, the recommendation? No. Okay. Are there any uh, additional com uh, comments from commissioners? And I'll call for a roll call vote on uh, the motion to approve uh, the staff recommendation with the additional conditions that are uh, that I'm not going to repeat since we just heard them and everybody knows what they are. So a roll call, please. All in favor. Commissioner Conway. Aye. Selman. Aye. Greenberg. Aye. Dawson. Aye. Chair Schiffer. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, uh, staff, for your work on this. And Mr. Simon, best of luck in moving the project uh, forward. All right, we'll now move to information items. Um, tell us what you know, Mr. Marlett. Uh, yes, a couple items of note. Um, there, there were two uh, items that were before you recently, the Front Riverfront Project and the Wharf Master Plan. They were both on the November 10th City Council meeting and both got continued. Um, the Front Riverfront Project will be heard on December 8th and then the Wharf uh, Management Plan on this coming Tuesday, the 24th. Uh, also on that uh, November 24th, City Council agenda are the inclusionary housing amendments that are related to Section 8. Um, and then as far as uh, upcoming agendas for the Planning Commission, um, at present we have both December meetings we have items for. Um, on the third, we've got the inclusionary housing amendments involving the workforce housing. Um, there's also an appeal of a staff approval of a, a three-unit apartment. Uh, building on Pennsylvania Avenue, um, and then there's also an objective development standards discussion involving the outreach strategy, uh, and then a presentation of the consultant work on some conceptual project te test fits on a couple sites. Um, and then uh, we also had tentatively scheduled the discussion with the city attorney regarding the commissioner comments in advance of meetings, but um, given the length of this agenda, we might. Um, schedule that for the 17th of December. And on the December 17th agenda, we have a um, an item that involves some reconfiguration of lot lines as well as some land use and zoning designation uh, reconfiguration um, for city and metro property downtown. Um, that's in, in preparation of an anticipated affordable housing project on that site. So um, you've got a pretty full December. That's all I have to report. Thank you very much. Uh, any subcommittee or advisory body all reports? We had the one from the Westcliff TAC. Um, any other? No? Okay. Uh, any items refer to future agendas? Seeing none, uh, we're adjourned, and I wish everybody a happy uh, COVID Thanksgiving. Stay healthy. <laughs> Thank you, Take everybody. Care, everybody. Yeah, Thank thanks you. for tonight. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.